Vibrant colors and a soft luster. In Japan, kimono have been worn and loved for centuries. What are these kimono made from? Silk, the queen of textiles. Silk is a natural fiber produced by silkworms that spin cocoons. Used on stringed instruments, silk produces lovely tones. Families practicing sericulture take great care of their silkworms. They're almost as precious as children. The filament obtained from the silkworm played a key role in Japan's modernization. Silk is a reminder of the hard work that contributed to Japan's growth. Now, thanks to state-of-the-art technology, silk is undergoing a transformation. this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at silk, a textile vital to Japan's traditional culture, and we unravel the secrets behind its enchanting qualities. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Our theme for today is silk, and in case you didn't know, Japan is the world's number one consumer of silk. I'm in a kimono shop, and of course, all of the products on sale here pretty much are made of silk, including these rather sumptuous kimono here. Silk as a textile originated in China, and experts say it was already in use there 5,000 years ago. Silk was considered as valuable as gold in trade with Europe, and the trade route along which it traveled became known as the Silk Road. The Silk Road carried silk all the way to Japan. Let's start off with a look at the role that silk has played in Japan over the centuries. Since ancient times, people in Japan have been captivated by the beautiful glow and the smoothness of silk. The Shaw Soin treasure house in Nara is home to many precious items, some over 1,000 years old. Its collection includes this skirt worn by a noblewoman in the 8th century. Silk has been woven into the fabric. In those days, too, silk was an extremely luxurious item. These are silk shoes embroidered with a floral pattern. Even after 1,000 years, they haven't lost the characteristic look of silk. Silk is a fiber secreted by the larvae of the silkworm moth. In Japan, this natural resource has been skillfully harnessed. Kimono are Japan's traditional garments. Silk kimono have always been luxury items, featuring dazzling colors and a kaleidoscopic variety of patterns. Red, yellow, purple, what makes these vibrant fabrics possible is how readily silk accepts dyes. A kimono like this is made using a process called Yuzen Resist Dyeing. Yuzen is one of Japan's signature dyeing methods. Designs of seasonal plants and flowers, birds and other natural motifs are drawn onto the fabric. This method of dyeing turns the fabric into a veritable painter's canvas. First, paste is applied along the lines of an undersketch. This prevents dye from bleeding into adjoining colors. Then the colors are applied to the fabric. Not only does silk take dye well, it's compatible with most dye stuffs. This is what gives Yuzen dyeing its limitless range of expression. Once the resist paste
found in no other natural fibre. It's elastic, yet strong and tear resistant. The shamisen is a traditional Japanese musical instrument. It uses silk strings. Strong, elastic silk gives the shamisen its distinctive sound. Silk fabric is also well suited to Japan's hot summers and cold winters. Silkworms spin out long filaments as they sway left and right. When these filaments are bundled together, air is trapped between the fibers. This improves heat retention. Let's compare silk pajamas with cotton pajamas, using a special camera that photographs extreme close-ups. With cotton, fuzz sticks up from the fabric. This impedes moisture evaporation. In contrast, because silk has no such fuzziness, it allows moisture to quickly evaporate. With its superb heat retention and moisture transfer properties, silk is cool to wear in summer, yet warm in winter. Notice how the dress ripples with a soft interplay of light and shadow as the wearer walks. On the right is a dress of polyester fabric. There's a hard edge delineation between light and shadowed areas. But with silk, there's a soft gradation between the light and shadowed areas. Take a close look at a single silk fiber. It's a dense bundle of many fine filaments. These are structure models of silk and polyester. Let's see what happens when light hits them. Polyester reflects light in a linear fashion. But the silk seems to emit rays of light almost at random. Light is repeatedly refracted and scattered by the fibers, producing a soft visual effect. This luminous quality can only be found in silk. Silk is a material that matches the Japanese aesthetic sensibility. Japanese people have used silk in many different ways. In addition to the kimono themselves, you have these obi or sash that goes with the kimono. These straps on the sandals too, these are made from silk. These carrion cloths or furoshiki, those are made from silk. There are even little bags for carrying accessories made from silk. I wonder if you know what these are. They're little silk cocoons, but you take one like this, you put it on your finger, and it's used for scrubbing away old skin. It takes dirt out of the pores. Silk contains a kind of protein, and it's also used in cosmetics lotions. These days, the various properties of silk can be explained by science, but in the past, people had no idea about such things. They didn't need science to tell them why silk was special. All they had to do was touch it. Silk, of course, is made from silkworms, and silkworms are an extremely important commodity to the farmers who raise them. Here in Gumma Prefecture in eastern Japan, sericulture has flourished for centuries. Mulberry bushes cover the slopes of the hills here. Silkworms feed on mulberry leaves, which farmers go out to pick early in the morning.
Raising silkworms takes place during the warmer months between spring and autumn. This farmer is raising 180,000 silkworms. Silkworm farmers buy just hatched silkworms and spend about a month raising them. Then the silkworms weave their cocoons. This is the busiest season for the farmers, without a moment's rest for days on end. Silkworms eat continuously, day and night. That means silkworm farmers have to attend to them all through the night too. And silkworms can only live in a certain range of temperatures. Tonight it'll be chilly until morning. So, I've got to raise the temperature. Silkworms are sensitive to both heat and cold, so the interior temperature must be kept at between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. We call them okosama, which means children. That's because they're as precious to us as our children. This stone monument honors a Japanese silkworm deity. People have long revered the silkworm as a precious source of income. Twenty-four days after hatching, silkworms begin to weave their cocoons. They stretch this way and that as they seek a place to spin their silk. Once they start moving their heads in such a manner, the silkworms are moved to the second floor. Rotating frames are used for cocoon making. Each square in the grid-like structure provides an ideal niche for a silkworm. This neat separation is a key factor in producing high-quality cocoons. The silkworm starts spinning filament. Once silkworms begin spinning a cocoon, they don't stop until they're done. For three days straight, they spin out a single unbroken filament that can reach up to 1,300 meters in length. Now the round cocoons are complete. About a month has passed since the larvae were brought here. When this place is full of silkworms, it seems so lively in here. When they're gone, it feels a bit sad, like something special is missing. It's bustling with life when the silkworms are here. The cocoons, so lovingly cultivated by silkworm farmers, are hand-reeled into thread. The softness of Japanese silk brings to mind the devotion of the people who raise the silkworms with tender care. I'm visiting a spinning mill in Yamagata Prefecture in the north of Japan. And here the cocoons that have been so painstakingly cultivated by the silkworm farmers begin a new existence, a silk thread. Let's take a look inside. Take a look at the scope of this. This machine here extracts the filament from the silk cocoon. The cocoons are first softened with steam and hot water. And then the tip of the filament is located automatically by the machine and the filament is reeled in. The filaments are then bundled into silk thread and the number of filaments is going to determine the thickness of the thread. It can be set to any number for the, for the desired thickness. The machine works completely automatically unless some problem arises, in which case one of these reels will stop and somebody will come and fix it and then it'll be restarted. This machine was built some 40 years ago and it's quite remarkable really that something this sophisticated could have been created back in that period. 
The silk industry over the years has contributed greatly to Japan's economic prowess. And we're going to go back now and take a look at some of that history. This is the former Tomioka silk mill in Gumma Prefecture. It was Japan's first state-run enterprise established in 1872. Back then, Japan desperately needed to earn foreign currency to pay for the country's modernization. Raw silk production offered a window of opportunity. The cost of construction was equivalent to 3 billion yen in today's money. That amounted to 0.5% of the entire national budget at the time. It was a massive national project. The factory was outfitted with the latest machinery imported from France. It was the most advanced silk mill in the world. The government put its prestige on the line for this mill. But in the early years, its output was disappointingly low. Japanese silk thread snapped easily and was of inconsistent quality. Then along came one man who changed all that, silkworm expert Kametaro Toyama. Toyama crossbred the highest quality silkworms in Japan. But he failed to obtain the results he was hoping for. Following years of frustration, Toyama set out for Thailand. There he found a Thai variety of silkworm that was disease resistant. He crossbred this with Japanese varieties. And the result was a large, strong cocoon. But as he continued breeding, he found that the second generation and beyond once again included small cocoons with weak thread. He discovered that the exceptional properties of crossbreeds were limited to the first generation. The fruit of Toyama's labors was a strong thread that was more than 25% longer than Japan's raw silk filaments. Many countries still haven't mastered single-generation crossbreeding to boost productivity. But Toyama recognized the need to exploit this phenomenon 100 years ago. His achievements were very significant. More and more Japanese silk began to be exported. By the 1910s, raw silk accounted for almost half the total value of Japanese exports. There were many others who helped to make Japanese silk a global brand. In particular, the women who worked at Tomioka Silk Mill. Tomioka Silk Mill employed more than 500 young women, an elite force selected from many applicants. In the oppressively hot and humid factory, they sometimes worked from dawn until dusk. They reeled the filaments from 10 cocoons at a time. They had to keep their hands moving constantly to make thread of a consistent thickness. Foreign visitors to the mill were astounded at the nimble fingers of the factory girl. The raw silk reeled by these women earned foreign currency that was invested to build Japan's national strength. In 1934, Japan claimed the top place in global silk production. Japan's modernization was powered by silk, 
and the determined efforts of the people working in the Japanese silk industry. The silk industry played a vital part in Japan's economic development, but after World War II, things began to change. With the liberalization of trade in 1961, Japan began to import cheap raw silk from abroad, and at the same time, synthetic fibers also became more widely used. As a result, Japan's production of raw silk fell to only about a one thousandth of what it was in its heyday. In 1934, when the industry was at its zenith, there were 236 silk mills in Japan. Today, only two remain, and this is one of them. The industry is in steep decline, but even now, people are involved in some interesting new initiatives. The sparkling sea of Okinawa Prefecture in southwest Japan. This is the home of a woman who wants to make the ultimate silk fabric. Her name is Michiko Uehara, and she's a weaver. She's aiming to weave a fabric using unbundled single filament threads spun by silkworms. These filaments are 70 times thinner than ordinary raw silk. Just 1 50th of a millimeter. Thinner than the lines in a fingerprint. It's very, very thin. But I can feel it really clearly in my fingers. Every strand is a thread of life. That's how I feel about it and why I think it's so special. There are 1,440 threads in the warp. Each one of them must be threaded through tiny holes and secured. Weihara has been weaving for more than 30 years, but she's never undertaken a task like this before. But almost as soon as she starts weaving, she comes to a halt. The filament is so fine that it snaps. Weihara has to stop each time this happens and re-thread the warp. The work demands dogged determination. It's been nine days since she started. Finally, the textile is taking shape. But a striped pattern is emerging. With an ordinary textile, this is an undesirable manifestation. We're dealing with living things. So, irregularity is natural. We tend to expect things to be absolutely uniform, but in a sense, being uniform is not a natural phenomenon. Two months after she started, her project is finally completed. A fabric woven from strands just one fiftieth of a millimeter thick. Weihara says it reminds her of the surface of the ocean, glimmering at sunset. The thinnest silk fabric in the world shimmers in the warm light of Okinawa.
These days, nearly all the raw silk used in Japan is imported. Not only that, but silk textiles and even kimono are sometimes made overseas, and then finished products imported into Japan. Understandably, great expectations are being put on the new initiatives taking place. And as silk is such an important part of Japan's traditional culture, one does hope that as much as possible of its beautiful legacy could be preserved. I'll see you again next time.